I invite you to open up in the Bible to Matthew chapter 13. Matthew is the first gospel for us in the New Testament. Matthew, we've already read about how he, he came to Christ as a tax collector whom Jesus called to follow him. And Matthew writes an eyewitness account of the ministry of Jesus. Matthew chapter 13, if you don't have a Bible, feel free to reach for one there in the pew and follow along with us. Back in the mid-70s, if you were around uh, watching TV, perhaps you did or didn't, this uh, particular show, around the same time that uh, American television was showing uh, Saturday Night Live and these kind of skits, uh, there was a Canadian company that came out with SCTV, SC Television, and uh, it eventually produced a lot of uh, individuals who became well-known in America. Uh, but one of the uh, skits was the Schmenge brothers, and it was John Candy and Eugene Levy. And uh, they were the Schmenge brothers from I, uh, the fictitious, I believe, nation of Lutonia. And they had this polka band, and they would have their, part of the, you know, that would, one of the skits would be, uh, hey, here we, it's, it's the time for the happy wanderers, a little bit of play on... Uh, you know, the Lawrence Welk show, but, you know, they, they really took it to a, 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 a nice, ridiculous uh, place. And a one, during the show, they had a commercial for their, one of their greatest hits albums. And the commercial is on, it's Eugene Levy. And, Hi, I'm Stan Schmenge, and this is our new album, Looking back, and he says, you can see the cover, and on the front cover, you just see the back of their heads, right? <laughs> and he goes, but the wonderful thing is when you flip it over, and they're looking at you on the back cover, you know, and he says, and, he, and of course, he, then he goes, you see, we're looking back at you on our looking back, and he's doing back and forth, and we get it, you know, I thought it was hilarious, right? I love their humor. Cracked me up, you know, that just, it, it, was, it was goofy, uh, but boy, I, I thought it was creative, and it was different, uh, SCTV, and uh, particularly, you know, the Schmenge brothers and their uh, band of happy wanderers. But their creative album cover was, was basically doing what? It was inviting you to take two different looks. Look at the front of the album cover, which, but, but turn around and look as intently at the back, you know. Take, take a look from both directions and see it. The parable that we've reached, actually two of them today, uh, I think are like that today. They have the same message, both of these parables. They say the same thing. But based on two absolute truths in Scripture, the parables can be viewed from two different perspectives. And they're both absolutely true and powerful. We read in Matthew chapter 13 and verse 44, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in the field, which a man found and hid again. And from joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has, and he buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking fine pearls. And upon finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. First thing we see is the clear stories themselves. You have a story first about a hidden treasure, right? The hidden treasure that's in a field. We don't, we're not used to that as much, right? While uh, many of you were just doing backbreaking work yesterday, uh, under, you know, uh, as a love gift to, to the Lord and as a, an act of kind of prophetic care for the children of, uh, of, of Poland and those of you on the team and not on the team, um, I was involved yesterday with a, a, a community cleanup we had here in town, and I had been asked kind of like to, to, to be part of it, and um, the team that I was with, we went over, one of the places that we were assigned to was um, the turf field over, you know, Woodlawn that way, and we're cleaning all up around it, and I saw a lot of stuff under the bleachers, and so I'm, I got down under the bleachers, and I'm kind of throwing <laughs> stuff in a bag, and 
Ooh, a quarter. I'm throwing more stuff. I thought I got 69 cents under that <laughs> set of bleachers, right? You know? I, 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 wow. Then you read a story that, I don't know if you ever heard the story, in 2014 from Northern California, this couple who had been living in their house for a while, uh, the path by their, their front steps eventually started getting worn down and they noticed a piece of metal and they played at it and they eventually dug up a can and it had gold coins in it. And they dug a little more and they found another can and another can and ultimately, they had 1,400 gold coins dated from 1847 to 1894. $10 million, right? Now, I'm not saying go home and dig up your yard, right? <laughs> I think after the last few years, maybe there's some coins in the Thompson's grant or buried a little bit. I don't know. What it, but uh, you leave their lot alone. They certainly deserve that. But... But back in that day, hiding treasure in the ground was understood. You, you, one of the things that happened is sometimes your area would be overrun by someone else. And they would plunder you. So where do you put your valuable stuff? You dig a hole and you bury it. Just try and remember where it was. Is there treasure under the ground still in places in our country? Absolutely. From years past where people buried stuff and they either died or they went and lost it or who knows what. But that was so common back then they understood it. Burying treasure was common. In the first story, the guy is in a field and he finds a treasure buried in the field and he decides, oh my goodness, this treasure is worth far more than everything I have. So I'm going to sell everything I have and buy the whole field and I get the treasure. And, and that's it's the heart of the story, a willingness to sell all that you have for something that's worth so much, of such great value. And the pearl, right? The, the, the precious pearl, the guy is obviously a merchant and he knows pearls and he finds the pearl that obviously the, the person holding it is unaware of the value. And remember, parables are not meant to every single angle and point. So if you're going, well, that's very unethical for not telling them the value of the pearl. The point is that there's such a value to it, he sells everything else he has to get that pearl. John MacArthur summarizes the parables and he says, A man found something so valuable that he sold everything he owned in order to get it. He was so overjoyed, so overwhelmed by the value of his discovery that he was eager to surrender everything he had in order to gain that treasure. And Jesus says, Listen to this parable. For the man seeking to hide the treasure... No, he doesn't say that. This is all we read, the parable. Did Jesus give them the interpretation? He may have. We know that everything in Scripture is truth, but not all truth is in Scripture. There are things that are true that are, that are, are not in here, right? Everything that's been revealed to us is what God has for us, and it's truth. Anything that conflicts with the truth of Scripture is obviously not truth, right? But this is the divine revelation he wants us to have. So Jesus didn't, uh, uh, the Holy Spirit didn't have Matthew record whether Jesus kind of said, here's what it is. And because of that, there are tremendous men and women, scholars, just regular believers like us who have studied, you read these passages, and will really, some will see it one way, some will see it another. Some see the, the man who's finding, or the, who's, who sees the value and is willing to sell of himself for it as being in fulfillment of the other parables of the sower, right? The sower went forth and planted the seed. The sower went and did this. And the sower was always who? It's Jesus. And so they would say that, that, that that's the man who goes and finds, sees the treasure is Jesus. Others would look at the parable and say, but wait, it follows the parable of the wheat and the tares, and it, it, it seems more that like, it, like the wheat, they understood the value of the kingdom and the tares didn't, and so they see the man finding the treasure as the wheat, a believer who says, wow. Charles Erdman says this, the teaching of these parables of how precious to the mind of Christ are his people and his church 
for which he gave up the glories of heaven and laid down his own life is true throughout Scripture. Yet, it might be better to find here illustrations of the fact that the ones who really understand the gospel message will be ready to make any possible sacrifice to follow it as a child of the kingdom. Which of those views is biblical? Yes. Both of them. What I mean is that they both are absolute incredible truth sitting there for us. And to me, the reality is that this parable in one sense... It, 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 these two parables are almost like a beautiful set of bifocals. You know, we're going to look at it one way, and then we're going to look at it another, and we're going to come away just... <sighs> we're going to look at the one side of the cover, and then we're going to flip it over and see there's like a heavenly view to this, and there's an earthly view to it, much like the way our God reveals salvation to us. He reveals it to us as human beings who are called to respond to the gospel. He reveals it to us from a heavenly perspective as a God who uh, selects those who will follow him. This, this sense of our God's incredible, infinite mind of God and so let's begin by looking at that heavenly view in essence of this because it's built on a clear picture and it's the picture of 1 John chapter 4. So if you turn to 1 John chapter 4, you'll see the clear picture and if you read the parable through the lens of this picture, you'll certainly understand the heavenly view of this, right? For in 1 John chapter 4, in verse 9, we read this, By this it, the love of God was manifested in us, that God has sent His only begotten Son into the world so that we might live through Him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. 1 John 4. If you're reading the Gospel of John 4, you're like, there's a woman at the well. I don't get it. So 1 John is later, uh, later in the Scriptures in case you were wondering where I was, right? But we read that and we come back to the parable that God displayed His love for us, that we love Him only because He first loved us. And we look at the parable, we say the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in the field which a man found and hid again. And we, the, the view of this belongs to God. This morning I was over in uh, the Wawa parking lot. Um, if, if you were on our own church Facebook page, you saw, at least from as I came around fellowship from leaving there, the view of the rainbow coming right down basically upon our church. But the other end of it, I was standing in the Wawa parking lot, and there it was. I had just come out with a cup of coffee, and I was, whoa, <sighs> I'm singing God of wonders, I'm, I'm caught in this view and oblivious to the fact that there's somebody wanting to park in the spot that I'm standing in, right? And they're not singing God of wonders, right? They're, their view is, who is this, is this deranged guy? I mean, I'm literally just looking there going, like, and, and I eventually kind of was like, oh, and, I, and, I, and I, you know me, I'm trying to go, oh, well, yeah, yeah, and, and they didn't want nothing to do with me trying to point their attention that way, right? But I had a view they didn't have. The view here is a view that belongs to God. He looks in the field. He looks at the pearls. And what does he see? Well, Paul tells us what he sees in Ephesians Chapter 2, in Ephesians chapter 2, Paul says, God looks in the field and this is what he sees. You were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them too, we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. Paul says God looks at the field, and what does he see? He sees us 
dead in our trespasses and sins. But he declares of his own will, I created you in my image. I created you to have eternal fellowship with me. You are a treasure to me. I have declared my value upon you as a precious pearl. And I say, who, who me? Paul says, yeah. But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. God says, I'm going to display your value to me by the sacrificial costly love. And the cost will be the life of his only son. Why? Because he was the only one worthy to pay for us. Whew. I remember years ago watching Hill Street Blues and one of the episodes was about a guy named Captain Freedom. He was a delusional fellow. He had a red tights on and a red down coat with a lightning bolt across it. He had a red World War I, you know, flying helmet with the goggles. He had his red gloves on. He had elbow pads, a cape. He had, you know, it was all. And in the middle of a shootout between the police and the robbers, he arrives on the scene and he jumps up on top of the car puts out his hand and he says, stop this criminal act. And they shoot him and they kill him and he lies there dead. You may say, well, what? That, that's, that's it. That's the episode. My point of it is this. <laughs> he was willing, but he wasn't able. Neither am I. And neither are you. In Revelation chapter 5, John is weeping. John is, is distraught in tears because of what he sees. He sees the scroll of life that cannot be opened because there is no one worthy to open it. All is lost. Revelation chapter 5 and verse 2, And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the book or look into it. Nobody had enough to sell to be able to buy the field. Nobody had enough to sell to be able to buy the pearl. And then I began to weep greatly because no one was found worthy to open the book or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, stop weeping. Behold, the lion that is from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has overcome so as to open the book at its seven seals. And I saw them and they began singing, worthy is the lamb. Jesus was not delusional he was able to sell everything he had. He was able to come up with the purchase price. He had enough in his account to buy the field. He was able and he was willing. The writer of the Hebrews says, with one offering, he purchased us forever. He was able and he was willing. <clears throat> Some years ago, Bob D'Alessandro and I were, went over to Sal and Joe's. <clears throat> we were eating at their house, and Greta and Debbie stayed there at their house. And Bob and I had gone into Sal and Joe's, and we, we got our takeout food. And as we're going to walk out the door, these two women, it was, it was just kind of getting dark. And these two women just came up to us, panicked. They said, we, we, 
would you, would, you, would you walk us to our car? Would you let us walk, walk us to our car? Well, you know, my ex is over there and I'm afraid of him. Can you make it look like we're on a date together? Can I take your arm? And, and she takes my arm. And, and, and inside, I'm, there's that part of me that, you know, wanted to stick up for my little sister and protect her and care for my wife. And, you know, that, that part of me as a guy that wants to be heroic, but as she's taking my arm and going, yeah, just, we're walking over here, and I'm looking at Bob, and, and, and there's the other part of me going, what, what's going on? What is this? Is this a trap? Is this a, you know, because I'm a pastor. Is somebody taking a picture of this? So, you know, what, 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 what am I stepping in? And I remember kind of going to, well, well, no, let go, like, let, let go of my arm. Like, I, what? A hesitant, vulnerable. Jesus saw the cost. He saw the rejection. He saw the spitting that was going to come to his face. He saw the nails. He saw the crown of thorns. He saw the slander. And he plunged in to rescue me because he said I was worth it. Paul says to the Philippians in Philippians chapter 2, have this attitude in yourselves which was also in Christ Jesus, who although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with a God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Jesus says in John chapter 10, listen, the others, they're gonna see what they can get from you. They're wolves. But I have declared that you are a precious pearl and I'm willing to give my life for it. I have declared that you are a treasure to me. Who has declared in your life that you have no value? Who has treated you as if you're not worth their time? Who has rejected you? Who has said you're not worth, I'm throwing you away. Look what he says. Because Jesus says, Vincent, you are a treasure to me and you're worth me sacrificing my body for. Vincent, you are a pearl to me and you're worth me shedding my blood for. And I find myself just wanting to sing the love of God. It's greater far than any pen or tongue can tell. It goes beyond the highest star and it reaches to the lowest hell the love of god how rich and pure how measureless and strong it shall forevermore endure the saints and the angel's song. That's our song. There is no greater love than that of Christ above that made him stoop to earth, become a man, and by his death provide salvation's plan. Whew. What of you? What of you? You may say, that's, my, that's the view I'm taking. <laughs> And it is the view I'm taking. But I'm also taking the next view, too. <laughs> and I don't worry about people saying, you got to pick one or the other. I, I, both of them point me to the beauty. The heavenly view is a view that 1 John 4, 9, and 10 point me to. The earthly view is, is a view that a picture from Philippians 3 points me to because what does the Apostle Paul say in Philippians chapter 3? In Philippians chapter 3 and verse 7, the Apostle Paul says, But whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. 
More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish so that I may gain Christ. Craig Blomberg says, the true disciple recognizes that God's kingdom is so valuable that it's worth sacrificing whatever it takes to walk as a citizen in it. Now understand this note. Anybody and everybody that holds that view agrees that the parable is not saying you buy your salvation. The parable is not saying that you can do enough, sell enough of your life, and you can put a down payment down on heaven. One writer says, if you gave everything you ever had and everything you will ever have, it still would be nowhere close enough to merit entry into God's kingdom. This illustration of a parable reveals that genuine faith never fails to appreciate the true cost of salvation and how valuable redemption is in terms of its eternal worth to the sinner. So that from the earthly view, it's you and I who realize the treasure of the gospel. We, we become so aware of the incredible pearl that's worth everything we have. In Luke chapter 19, we have an example of that where Zacchaeus, right? Zacchaeus knows what's valuable in life, money. And if I got to cheat you to get some more, I'll do it. And he does. He goes into the house with Jesus and we don't know what Jesus says in the house. But we know this. Somehow what Jesus said in the house was this. Zacchaeus, I have a pearl to offer you. It's worth everything. Zacchaeus comes out of the house not paying for his salvation, but so aware of what he has been offered by Christ that now the money means nothing compared to the pearl that he's been given. And he's willing to part with it. As a believer, when you read this parable, I think it's even more when you read it first with the one view and you stand there in awe of how much that Jesus, that God would set this value on me and that Christ would be the only one and be able and willing to pay the cost and ransom me as his treasure. When I, when I plunge into that view and I come out of the water, I'm ready to dive back into the ocean from the other, the other way. In a sense of, I am so aware of the incredible worth of being your child. Nothing in my life should be held back. I've read to you before from this book by uh, Martha Morgan Kern, Letters from the Middle Years. I've had it for years. and I love it because she just is... She's just so willing to stop and look at her life and over different periods and look at people and, and kind of write them a letter. Some of them aren't alive anymore, but she writes them a letter. And one of them is to a fellow, Dear Mark. She says, Dear Mark, the thought of you, old friend, evokes a mishmash of feeling in me. On the one hand, I want to laugh. You're always so funny, clever beyond all reason, a moving field of energy, and I find myself smiling as I remember you. But then on the other hand, your name conjures up an unbearable blend of grief and confusion. One day you were here, bounding around, working hard, married to my dear cousin, and raising four small kids, and the next day you weren't. You went on a routine business trip to the West Coast and for no reason anyone could fathom, you died in your hotel room and just like that, a heart attack came and left with you. Mark, suddenly my clock was ticking. Death made me more aware of life and its inescapable brevity. 
Everything I had once taken for granted came under my intense scrutiny. Urgently, I reassessed virtually every facet of my life, and I wasn't happy with what I found. Not only had I abandoned many of my dreams, but I had become a slave to my paycheck, a junkie whose drug was the approval of others, a soul whose core was essentially empty. Mark, I was going through the motions of middle life, caught up in the beat of the workaday world, keeping my children dressed and fed, running my house, when it finally occurred to me that all this dancing is meaningless if there is no music. She goes on to share how she had had a faith as a child and had walked away from it. And she, this and that, and went through anger with God and this and that. And she says, as a thoughtful, discerning person, I eventually came back to God. After all my searching and prodding, all my investigative reading and philosophical hunting, there could be no denying him. I felt as if something had happened to me. For Mark, something had. For there is a significant difference between the mere inheritance of faith and its miraculous, hard-fought discovery, alive and pulsing in one's own heart, the experience is distinct, it's illuminating, it's life-giving, it's life-changing. That's what the parable reminds me. Vincent, remember what it is. It's worth everything. Vincent, remember how precious your salvation, your walk with God is. And it is worth letting go of everything that pulls you away from that. It's worth surrendering all you have in trust to Him and for His use. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in the field which a man found and hid again. And from joy over it, he sells it. Sells all that he has and buys it. Jesus in John 15 says, Abide in me. Make me everything. I'm your treasure. And I'm telling you this so that your joy may be full. It's so worth everything else. Let it go. Leave, leave it behind today. What is it that, what, what sin has somehow become valuable to you. It's nothing compared to the treasure. Let it go. I came across the lyrics of this song today. Some of you, I, I don't know if it's... I don't know if it's a, 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 it was a Gaither event or whatever, but... The fellow writes these words. He says, As my little girl played with the kids across the street, the tone of her voice caught my ear. What she said was so precious, her little face aglow, I could hardly hold back the tears. Something's happened to daddy. He's not the same anymore. Things are different at our house like never before. Mommy says... He met Jesus, and he washed him white as snow. Something has happened to Daddy, I know. The kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking fine pearls, and upon finding one of great value, went and sold all that he had and bought it. There's a little book of children's prayers. It's simply called children's prayers, so you'll probably have a hard time finding it because there's so many out there. One little prayer in there just says this, Dear God, count me in. Your friend Herbie. <laughs> you know, it. Sometimes it's just, you know, in your own life, just the freshness of it. Count me in. Father, we thank you for these parables. Whew. 
I'm your treasure? I'm your pearl? Father, you are certainly ours. Lord Jesus, count us in. Count us in with great joy. We pray in your precious name. Amen.